Welcome to Understanding China, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation series dedicated to helping Americans better understand the nature of the People's Republic of China, the Chinese Communist Party, and key issues in US-China relations. I'm Murray Bassett, Director of Academic Programs, and I'm pleased to present to you today John Suarez, a veteran human rights activist and the Executive Director of the Center for Free Cuba. John has testified before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in Washington, DC, the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, and served as an interpreter for Cuban dissidents in congressional hearings here in America. Since 2009, he has maintained the blog Notes from the Cuban Exile Quarter, and you can follow his work on Twitter at John J. Suarez. The subject of today's event, China, Cuba, and the coronavirus, is important for those who seek to understand the global implications of CCP rule and the policies and actions that they take. We are truly privileged to have John here with us. Following his presentation, we will have a discussion with him drawing upon questions submitted by the audience. And with that, John, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation for this opportunity to uh, take part in this conversation. I think it's a very important conversation. I'm gonna switch to a PowerPoint presentation that I have and uh, we'll get underway. The title of this presentation is China, Cuba and the Coronavirus. How are Cuba and China connected in the context of coronavirus? And I'm going to go back a bit into Cuban and China's history, but first I want to focus on the, the power ideas that these regimes share, and they have a common ancestry, which is communism. And it goes back to Marxism, Leninism, and the ideas enunciated by Vladimir Lenin, for example, and this is from a, an address he gave to young uh, students on October 2nd of 1920. The class struggle is continuing, and, it's, and it is our task to subordinate all interests to that struggle. Our communist morality is also subordinated to that task. We say, morality is what serves to destroy the old exploiting society and to unite all the working people around the proletariat, which is building up a new communist society. Mao Zedong, 1938. Every communist must grasp the truth. Political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Fidel Castro, March 26, 1964. I conceived the truth in terms of a just and noble end. And that is when the truth is truly true. If it does not serve a just, noble, and positive end, truth as an abstract entity, philosophical category, in my opinion, does not exist. All of these uh, concepts of truth is defined by the ends justifying the means. In this case, class struggle with the objective of installing a communist regime. Truth is in service to that. Truth is determined by power, as Mao indicates, with power coming out of the barrel of a gun. And that has ramifications for how they deal with things like coronavirus. But I'm, I, as I said before, I want to go back a bit into the history between Cuba and China that I think is quite important. First, there is a uh, China-Cuba relations that pre-exist uh, communism. Uh, Cuba and China have a relationship that goes back to the colonial era. 125,000 Chinese came to Cuba between 1847 and 1889. Uh, they were there to uh, basically uh, replace uh, African slave labor, especially after 1878. And these Chinese uh, migrants were enticed with offers of working for 20 to 30 cents a day. But they also had an important role to play in wars of Cuban independence and uh, between 1868, 1878, and again in the Cuban War of Independence between 1895 and 1898. So it's much of a, a character of the Cuban people. And there is a Chinatown, which you see a picture of up there. Uh, paradoxically, after Fidel Castro comes to, first off between 1940 and 1959, there was a huge influx of Chinese into Cuba fleeing Mao's China. And then in 1959, there was a huge exodus of Chinese, not only the Chinese that have come from mainland China, but also the uh, Chinese community that had been there from the 19th century, leaving uh, Cuba's Chinatown to a hollowed out uh, 300 or so Chinese Cubans remaining out of a once vibrant community. But let's focus now on what happened after 1959. Uh, Cuba broke relations with Taiwan in 1960. 
beginning in 1959, they were already having feelers with uh, reaching out to Mao Zedong. As you can see here, there's pictures of Mao and Che Guevara meeting in 1960. Uh, that's Che Guevara also meeting with high-ranking uh, official Zhao and Lai. The, these were, and this was at a time when the Great Leap Forward was taking place, when a conservative estimate would put it at 30, 35 million Chinese were starving to death. Uh, the Chinese communists were competing with the Soviet Union for their um, spot in, on the international stage, trying to be the dominant player. So despite millions of Chinese starving to death, China was exporting uh, food and grain that would have saved millions of Chinese to Cuba to be able to one-up the Soviet Union during that time. Now, because of that competition, relations between the USSR and China cooled. And by 1962, Mao Zedong was heavily criticizing Nikita Khrushchev for backing down in the 1962 Cuban Missile Crisis. And this was seen as one of the last straws in a series of slights between the two communist powers that set the stage for the Sino-Soviet split. But this also created a split within the Cuban communist revolutionary leadership. Fidel and Raul Castro sided with the Soviet Union and Ernesto Che Guevara sided with China. In 1966, Fidel Castro uh, would give heavily critical speeches against Mao's regime in China, also attacking Mao personally. Now, what changed? The relationship cooled for 20 years, but then began warming up again in 1985, thanks to Mikhail Gorbachev. Fidel Castro viewed Gorbachev and Glasnost perestroika as existential threats to his continued rule and began warming his relations with the People's Republic of China while cooling it with the Soviet Union. In Cuba, as a matter of fact, they were banning Soviet publications that were expressing ideas of Glasnost and perestroika. Meanwhile, in June of 1989, when much of the world was condemning China uh, for the Beijing crackdown in Tiananmen Square, uh, the Cuban foreign minister commended Chinese authorities for defeating the counter-revolutionary acts, quote unquote. And this warming process continued with a state visit by President Jiang Zemin in 1993. And this was followed up by the first state visit to Cuba, uh, excuse me, the first state visit to China by Fidel Castro in November of 1995. And you can see him there at the uh, Great Wall of China. And these visits have continued and, and ties strengthened since then. Now I'm going to, and as you can see here, from 1995 to the present, the Chinese and Cuban regimes have forged a strategic relationship. Uh, there's actually a, a major spy base in Cuba in a location called Bejucal, where you have uh, Cuban electronic intelligence battalions and Chinese working together to listen in on phone conversations with millions of Americans. Um, they are also obviously sharing intelligence. A lot of it's industrial espionage, but I'm sure national security issues are also uh, being uh, compromised. And here I wanna to touch on something that many people don't give much, uh, pay much attention to. With that cooling of relations between China and the Soviet Union, China was left at a disadvantage and that was in the area of biotechnology and biological warfare. Carl W. Ford, and this was back in 2002, uh, testified that they believed that Cuba had at least a limited developmental offensive biological warfare research and development effort underway, and that Cuba was providing dual-use biotechnology to rogue states. Uh, Ken Alabek, who was the number two, a KGB colonel, second in command in the Soviet Union's biological warfare division known as Biopreparat, in his book, uh, Biohazard, uh, described how when he attended the uh, funeral services of a colleague, uh, he and his other colleagues began discussing uh, Cuba's surprising achievements in genetic engineering. Uh, someone mentioned that Cuban scientists had successfully altered strains of bacteria at a pharmaceutical facility just out of Havana. Quote, where did such a poor country get all of that knowledge and equipment? I asked, from us, of course. His colleague answered with a smile. A little more information on Ken Alabak. As I said before, second in command in the Soviet Offensive Biological Warfare Program. He defected in 1992. He, just, he also wrote about his boss, Major General Yuri Kalinin, who visited several Cuban biotechnology facilities in 1990. 
and told him that he was convinced the Castro regime was deeply involved in a biological warfare research effort. Uh, Alibek is widely respected in the U.S. biological warfare community and in 1999 told the Miami Herald, Kalinin saw no weapons production, but with his experience in offensive biological warfare work, it was his opinion that they were doing offensive work also. Why is this important? China had a deficit. The Soviets, in part thanks to Nazi scientists that recruited after the end of World War II, who had been experimenting on humans, were able to get a step ahead. Their program had been very backwards due to policy decisions made by Stalin in the, in the 30s and 40s, and they were able to catch up with their biotech and biowarfare efforts in the 40s, 50s, and, and 60s. And the Cubans were able to take advantage of this, but the Chinese were not because of that, that cooling of relations. So Havana has actually helped Beijing in developing its biotech capability. Wired Magazine, the Association for the Study of the Cuban Economy, have published articles demonstrating that and how communist China and Cuba have set up biotech factories in a south-to-south -south technology transfer, which has led to developments of biotech medications in Beijing and Shanghai. Uh, and these techniques were provided by Havana, were provided to Havana by the Soviet biotech sector, and then in turn provided to the Chinese. And those, that's uh, the China-Cuba Biotech Joint Innovative Center that you can see the picture of, and some Cuban scientists, and this is based in China. Some more pictures of the, of the center, the, the, called the Shangchun Heber Biological Technology Joint Venture. It was opened in 2003 and it dedicated to developing biotech products. It's now open in the province of Hunan, located in China's central region. And it's de dedicated to developing, quote unquote, 100% Cuban projects, according to the Castro regime's embassy in Beijing that posted that claim on Twitter January 1st of 2020. And some more pictures you can see of the actual location. Now, this joint venture is seeking to profit off of the COVID-19 epidemic. Here you see two uh, tweets, one from uh, the puppet president, Miguel Diaz-Canel Bermudez, from February 7th of 2020, advertising interferon alpha 2b, the Cuban drug used in China against the coronavirus, our support to the Chinese government and peoples and their effort. And then on the right, you have Nicolas Maduro, and this was on March 11th, claiming that around 3,500 lives have been saved in China thanks to the interferon from Cuba. Now, these claims should be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, the Castro regime was late in closing down travel to the island, it was also making claims that they had everything under control, Havana Tour UK, which is a front for the Cuban military, uh, was declaring in March, on March 11th, that Cuba right now has 29 to 32 degrees Celsius. There was the whole claim that warm temperatures would kill the virus and that coronavirus doesn't replicate at high temperatures, and they were encouraging people to travel there. And that's another advertisement from Havana Tour about the radiant sun that kills bacteria, fresh air to oxygenate your lungs. There was also a minister a minister of uh, the Ministry of Tourism had a high-ranking official come out in mid-March calling on people from Europe to visit Cuba because they had the infrastructure to take care of them as long as they followed their instructions and Cuba was ready for coronavirus. Um, and this propaganda offensive can be seen in, in different markets. Uh, China was reporting success in treating COVID-19 patients with interferon alpha 2b from Cuba. But obviously, they had a stake in that success. Uh, it's helping its ally Cuba develop the drug. It's a joint venture, so they'll both be profiting from it. What's interesting is that most scientists also question alpha 2b as a COVID medicine. There's no single clinical trial showing the benefit of interferon alpha 2b. A doctor, according to Dr. Alfonso Rodriguez Morales of Venezuela, who's vice president of the Colombian Association of Infectious Diseases and a leading Latin American epidemiologist. And this was from an article by Tim Paget that came out uh, on April 20th. But you can see what was circulating in the news uh, features. From South Africa, a mayor was actually declaring that interferon alpha 2b was a vaccine to cure coronavirus, which was untrue. Chile's communist mayor, was calling for was importing Cuban meds to combat COVID-19, and obviously the chief medicine that they're claiming is effective is interferon alpha 2b. Uh, 
and even Newsweek was calling this a wonder drug to fight coronavirus around the world. And this is a propaganda offensive to sell Cuba's China's COVID-19 cure. And what's concerning is that looking at scientific journals such as Science and The Lancet, they offer a much more cautionary tale. Susan Harold, expert pulmonary infections at the University of Geisen interviewed in Science warns, use of interferon beta on patients with severe COVID-19 might be risky. If it is given late in the disease, it could easily lead to worse tissue damage instead of helping patients. The Lancet reported that in animal models designed to understand the temporal profiles of the SARS and Middle East respiratory syndrome diseases, authors showed that interferon alpha and interferon beta early on could be beneficial, but it was damaging in later stages. So this is a problematic um, treatment, not a cure, and it hasn't been shown to be an effective treatment as of yet, but it, it shows that it does have a downside. Again, the propaganda offensive has an ideological component. Uh, we can see here the Countercurrents Collective uh, discussing how China and Cuba have stepped up and stepped in with practical measures at international level amidst the near collapse healthcare situation in a number of capitalist countries in the face of the coronavirus epidemic. Communist Party USA is also claiming that ideology matters, and obviously their claim is that the communist ideology is best able to counter this. Despite the fact that uh, evidence has shown that the countries that have been able to respond best to this are free societies like Taiwan, South Korea, uh, Germany, and others. And frankly, the numbers out of mainland China can't be trusted, nor can the numbers being provided by Cuba, but I'll get to that later. Again, the World Health Organization chief, uh, Tedros Adhanom, has, uh, we've seen in the press, his uh, uh, kowtowing to the Chinese communist regime, but he also has that type of relationship with the Castro regime and providing unearned propaganda about the Castro regime's healthcare system. And you see him here with Bruno Rodriguez on the left, the Cuban foreign minister, February of 2020, and April of 2018 on the right with Miguel Diaz-Canel during his visit to Cuba. The reality is Cuba trails in testing compared to other Latin American countries. Uh, coronavirus tests per million, as you can see here. Chile is leading with 5,945, Peru follows with 4,360, and Cuba arrives at a distant third with 2,234. And the source for that is uh, Professor Steve Hankey of the John Hopkins University. And I'd like to focus now on the problem with the Cuban government's reporting on epidemics. Its track record is not good. Cuba is not transparent in its reporting similar to its Chinese counterpart. Uh, Dwayne Gubler at Duke uh, NUS Medical School in Singapore said that Cuba has a history of not reporting epidemics until they become obvious, and Zika is only mildly symptomatic in adults. And this was part of, this came out in New Scientist in 2019, and this was describing an outbreak that took place in 2017, where thousands of people came down with Zika, it wasn't reported, they were able to trace it back because tourists that were visiting uh, Cuba were coming back with Zika and they were able to trace those infections of tourists from several countries around the world back to Cuba. And the consequences are quite severe. On the right, you see a baby with microcephaly due to Zika virus. Other epidemics not reported about until whistleblower spoke out or spoke up was the dengue epidemic in 1997 and a cholera outbreak in 2012. And those are the ones that we know of. Similar to what's taken place in China, human journalists and other whistleblowers have been targeted and silenced in the past. Uh, the regime has actually set up new laws to further restrict communication, in this case, targeting the internet with the decree law 370 which declares anyone who, quote, disseminates through public data, transmission networks, information contrary to social interest, morals, good customs, and the integrity of the people can be prosecuted. Now, what does this translate to into action? Well, uh, we've already seen a Cuban journalists find 3,000 pesos, uh, the equivalent of $2,500. The average Cuban makes about uh, 
10 to $20 a month. So you can do the math of how devastating that is in terms of a fine. And once you can't pay that, the next step is prison. But even prior to this new law, journalists were being jailed for breaking news on epidemics. Calixto Martinez, who you see photographed on the right, was jailed in 2012 for his reporting on a cholera outbreak. Dr. Desi Mendoza was jailed and forcibly exiled in 1997 for reporting on a dengue outbreak. And this concludes my presentation. I want to thank you very much for uh, listening to me, and I await your questions. Thank you, John, for a wide-ranging and illuminating presentation. Uh, before we proceed, I just want to remind everyone that you can submit questions for John at the, via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. And at this point, I'm going to turn to some of them that have already come in. Uh, Let's see. So it's, it's quite common to hear a very high praise for the Cuban medical system, for the doctors. Uh, you know, they, they send them around the world as part of their medical mission. Um, you know, but I have some understanding that I've, that I've garnered from you uh, in, in the past. Uh, but would you be able to fill in for the rest of the attendees, uh, you know, shed a little more light on the system how it operates, uh, its actual state of advancement, the level of care that it actually delivers for the Cuban people, uh, as well as the political aspect of, of access to treatment. Well, I think if, let's begin with the doctors who are being shipped overseas. Um, what it amounts to is human trafficking. Cuban doctors are obligated to travel overseas anywhere between 90 to 75 percent of what they earn overseas goes directly to the Castro regime. Uh, they're not allowed to travel overseas with their families. And if they uh, wish to stay overseas and not return to Cuba, they are punished by not being able to see their family for eight years and having uh, their pay docked as well. The, there's an important story that came out in March of 2019, the New York Times had examined what Cuban doctors were doing in Venezuela during Maduro's last illegitimate election. What was uh, shocking from the report was that these Cuban doctors were being instructed by uh, intelligence, well, they're being monitored by intelligence officials, but instructed by them to restrict medical care for political objectives. And the New York, New York Times article, and the New York Times usually bends over backwards to give the Castro regime the benefit of the doubt. And in fact, there's a history there of benefiting the regime that goes back to the 1950s. But even the New York Times was reporting how these doctors were denying oxygen and other life-saving treatments for political objectives and not providing treatment to op members of the opposition. The other thing that came out shocking in the story was that not all of the people wearing the robes of doctors were in fact doctors or healthcare workers. And they were going out practicing medicine literally without a license. And the Cuban doctors that were actually doctors were, that defected later on expressed their misgivings about that and wondered how many people were killed. So that's the issue of these, of these doctors being trafficked. One of the great scandals, and this goes back to the World Health Organization, is that its subsidiary in the Americas, the Pan American Health Organization, had a corrupt relationship with the Castro regime where they profited off of these trafficking of doctors. And that's something that's being investigated and the Pan American Health Organization is being sued by some of these Cuban doctors currently. Now, to talk about the Cuban healthcare system itself, one, the Castro regime has been very effective at doing two things, building up its reputation post-1959, and we can see with this campaign now over interferon alpha 2b, using communist networks to build up that reputation, while at the same time trying to wash away what existed pre-1959. And there are important studies that demonstrate through UN statistics and um, other objective sources that between 1900 and 1959, the Cuban healthcare system delivered better results in infant mortality and overall mortality than the Cuban government between 1959 and 2000. Why is that? Cuba during that period, despite the periodic political convulsions, was more or less a free society. There was a strong labor union movement that was able to lobby for their uh, workers to get 
good healthcare benefits. And there was also a very solid uh, group of Cuban doctors. Um, the gentleman who discovered that the mosquito was the vector for yellow fever, Carlos Finlay was a Cuban. He was nominated for the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1906. In the 1959-1960, going back to research done in 1938, a Cuban doctor of the last name Castellanos was nominated twice for the Nobel Prize in Medicine for the work he did in being able to provide um, um, dyes to be able to see the functioning in the human heart in the 1930s. That level of quality research was washed away by the arrival of the Castro regime because in the absence of freedom and free inquiry, many of these doctors fled the country. You don't see that kind of uh, excellence in the doctors in Cuba since then. There have been no Cuban doctors, as far as I know, nominated for the Nobel Prize in medicine since 1959. The other thing is we have seen cases of neglect where patients have died in medical facilities in Cuba. One of the most shocking was in 2010 in a psychiatric facility in Havana called Masorra, in which over 20 some odd patients died of exposure because the staff had actually removed uh, glass windows and left them to die from a cold front that came through. And the cadaver, someone, a whistleblower who was never identified, took pictures of the cadavers and they looked like victims from a concentration camp. And this was Cuba 2010. The doctors coming out of the island, when they tell, you know, when I asked them about the claims made by the World Health Organization in PAHO about Cuba um, succeeding in, in eliminating mother child HIV transmission in the island, when I asked them, they roll their eyes and say it's ridiculous. And it's been demonstrated that Cuba has one of the highest infection rates in the region for HIV currently overall. So it's, it's a claim that really won't stand up to much scrutiny. Um, the other thing, and it just came out today, the American interest and others are repeating Cuba propaganda claims of how well Cuba has handled this coronavirus outbreak. The reality is they waited until late March to shut things down. They were inviting, and as we saw in those slides, tourists from Europe. And their primary source of tourism from Europe is Italy. Another primary source of tourism is China. So to believe that they didn't have a case of coronavirus until mid-March is a little hard to stomach. And they were claiming it was coming from an Italian tourist in, in mid-March. I'm pretty sure that started beforehand. And why do I base that on? Well, what has the Cuban government done in the past with Zika, dengue, cholera, and other outbreaks? They've covered it up to the, at the point where they've risked the lives of Cubans and tourists. And I believe they're probably doing the same thing now. And I was, again, talking with folks that have access to personnel in hospitals, and they're very doubtful of the data the Cubans are putting out because the rates of increase of cases, it's constant, and that doesn't pass muster when we look at what's happening in other countries. Thank you, John. Um, so has the Cuban regime been exploiting the coronavirus pandemic, this crisis that, that is is global in character to increase repression on the island and to expand this medical mission, uh, uh, you know, to expand their trafficking of, of doctors? Uh, yes, they have, and they're, but they're also doing it for reasons of desperation. The Castro regime, two of its major, uh, its, its major source of funding have been the exporting the doctors around the world. But then its other two major areas of funding are tourism and oil from Venezuela. Now, as you've seen in the news, the oil prices have collapsed. Tourism is non-existent. So the regime really, for its own survival, has had to really push uh, the exportation of doctors around the world. And obviously, if there's shortages of medical personnel and countries are desperate to have um, healthcare workers on hand in, in, under these extreme circumstances, it's a good market for them to sell their wares internationally, and they're profiting from it. At the same time, my concern is, since there is such a great demand, are they all actual healthcare workers? Are we, gonna, are we seeing, will we find out later that a repeat of what was done in Venezuela is now happening in other places where 
people who are not doctors or nurses are treating patients in exchange for hard currency that the regime desperately needs? Secondly, how many doctors are remaining in Cuba? I mean, the, some of the numbers I've seen talk about 1,200 doctors uh, going out just over the last few days, and there's supposedly tens of thousands of doctors overseas. Leads to the question, how many are remaining back home to take care of Cubans? And the reports we're getting is medical students are the ones going out and doing monitoring, not doctors or nurses. So it looks like things may be spread rather thin there. Um, we also know that they started late, that Cubans, because of the internet, were able to realize what was going on around the world and were terrified that the Cuban government wasn't shutting down schools or encouraging the practicing of social distancing. And there was a situation there where some um, principals of schools independently started shutting down without instructions from on high. And that was creating uh, a crisis for the regime. And then the regime shortly afterwards is when they started taking those practices. So there's some, they're under some serious pressure. Yeah, and also, yeah. and I just want to add one thing to your question about repression. Yes, they are taking advantage of repression. They're expanding it, but they're also doing it for a very important reason for their propaganda. They need to give the impression that they're succeeding with the coronavirus outbreak in Cuba. So videos which have emerged, the bodies on the street are not good for them. Uh, report of mothers complaining that Raul Castro and Miguel Diaz Canal are responsible for their loved one dying or being ill with coronavirus, that's not good for their propaganda uh, campaign. And they have detained people for that, and they are punishing people that are trying to report and get the news out of what's actually going on. Now, you just mentioned their propaganda efforts and their doctor's program, this trafficking of, of doctors, is a key component of that. Um, you know, so how can we actually learn the real contractual terms that these doctors are having to sign up for or what it is that, that the host countries are actually paying? Uh, and then also, how can we better disseminate the truth about these medical missions? That is, that they are a leading form of human trafficking. Well, these relations, these contracts are between the Cuban government and the, the country that is hosting the doctors. The doctors are basically sent there like chattel. They're not signing a contract per se. However, a number of these doctors have defected. They are suing, and a lot of information is coming out about these practices, and they're publicly available. The issue is to share that information with others. The regime is good at spinning falsehoods but then having it echoed and repeated through their agents of influence around the world. And we're also seeing that with the Chinese through uh, news publications, but also Twitter. Lamentably, there's also the case that, as we saw in China, um, major news media sources were kicked out of the country. That's also happened in Cuba over the years. So unfortunately, over the years, the international media in Cuba has been conditioned and they've been conditioned that to stay in Cuba, they need to compromise their journalistic integrity. And when a journalist tries to push a little harder and report a, a, a little more factually, a little more hard hitting the news, and they pass a certain invisible line, they're kicked out of the country. And those that remain then, you'll see them fall more in line because they don't want to be kicked out. And that's something we're seeing today. If you look at uh, the feed of the Reuters uh, correspondent in Cuba. It, it reads like something out of grandma. Now, how can we combat this communist propaganda, whether it's coming from China or Cuba, uh, when we do have just so much disinformation floating around? And to what extent do you think the presence of sympathizers uh, to the revolutions or uh, to these regimes uh, plays a role in, in preventing us from properly addressing it or complicates that effort? I think that, that you have sympathizers, but you have co international communist networks and they help each other <laughs> and they help in propagating the propaganda, be it Chinese communist propaganda, Cuban communist propaganda. You'll even find those extremists that'll try to do it for North Korea, who by the way, I think North Korea still claims that there are zero cases of coronavirus so, you know, an amazing healthcare system, no doubt. Um, but I think what we need to do is friends of freedom 
need to hold those sympathizers accountable. We need to be vigilant on social media. We need to be writing letters to the editor, um, our own op-eds, challenging um, some of the this coverage that, that is ridiculous. And I think one example of this that we saw recently was when uh, Senator Bernie Sanders came out making claims about Cuba's healthcare and educational system that a lot of people came out and challenged them and called them to task on the facts. And I think that was helpful. And I think it may have played a role in um, him not being the nominee currently. Now, we've seen with the World Health Organization and its parodying of CCP uh, disin disinformation and propaganda in the lead up and in fact, in an ongoing way to a lot of, to a great extent, uh, during the coronavirus pandemic. You know, so we've seen the, the capability of communists to uh, co-opt international organizations. Uh, now looking at the WHO's affiliate uh, or subsidiary here in the Americas, the Pan American Health Organization, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about Cuba's relationship there uh, with, with the PAHO? Uh, it's a terrible relationship that goes back decades. Uh, in addition to Cuba and the Pan American, not Cuba, the Castro regime and the Pan American Health Organization, um, setting up a corrupt relationship where the Pan American Health Organization was working hand in glove with the Castro regime in the trafficking of doctors in Brazil and is now implicated in lawsuits by those Cuban doctors um, is a scandal. And I think that the Pan American Health Organization, to echo Mary O'Grady in the Wall Street Journal, should be audited and should be held to account, as should the World Health Organization with what's happened with this coronavirus pandemic. Um, in addition to that, I think it's also important to point out that the Pan American Health Organization has given awards uh, to Cuban physicians for their wonderful work. I mentioned uh, the hospital in Havana, Masora. The gentleman who was managing that hospital for decades, that hospital where patients were dying due to exposure, was uh, given one of the top awards by the Pan American Health Organization for his good works. So it's a complete disconnect from reality. It's the same thing, and it's not only, I mean, we're talking about the World Health Organization and PAHO, but I mean, UNESCO, which I was, I was cheering when the U.S. Uh, pulled out uh, from the organization, had declared the works of Ernesto Che Guevara um, international patrimony and has been promoting those works, which basically advocate for terrorism and guerrilla warfare. That's, a pan that's UNESCO. Then you have the U United Nations Human Rights Council, where you have uh, such... Uh, countries as Cuba, Venezuela, <clears throat> Communist China, and North Korea as members in recent years, uh, engaging in uh, not human rights promotion, but human rights suppression. I, I was actually a witness uh, years back when China was under the gun of the Universal Periodic Review and was being examined for its human rights violations. And Cuba's recommendation uh, during that review was that China wasn't repressing enough it's dissidents and it's formal recommendation that they need to get tougher on the dissidents and be tougher uh, on human rights in, in China. It's, a, it's an absurdity. That's incredible, uh, utterly incredible. Um, now, earlier you mentioned three main sources of foreign currency for the Cuban regime, uh, doctors, tourism, and oil. Uh, but a number of our attendees have been asking about a fourth. Uh, what about drug trafficking? I mean, we know well, that the Venezuelan regime and the Nicaraguan regime are involved in drug trafficking. Uh, is, is this something that the Cubans are also involved in? They're heavily involved in it, but unlike the doctors, tourism, and oil, uh, there's not much published about <laughs> the amounts. So it's, it's much more difficult to measure it. But we do know, and there's some wonderful documentaries I'd recommend. Uh, Frontline had a 1990 documentary called Cuba and Cocaine that actually showed video of Cuban gunboats and helicopters protecting uh, speedboats full of cocaine um, from the U.S. Coast Guard and the U.S. military. 
uh, Fidel Castro and Raul Castro and high ranking members of the Cuban military have been implicated in drug trafficking. Uh, Fidel Castro in the trial of Manuel Noriega, the Panamanian strongman who was captured and put on trial and jailed for his massive role in drug trafficking. Uh, during his trial, it was revealed that Fidel Castro had acted as a mediator between uh, Manuel Noriega and some drug cartels had been upset because Noriega, to um, look good to some elements in the DEA, had uh, identified some drug traffickers and served them up to the DA while working with others and had ticked them off. So Manuel Noriega went to Fidel Castro and Fidel Castro served as mediator to bring peace between the drug cartels and Manuel Noriega. Uh, Raul Castro was, uh, had, was looking at an indictment before the Clinton administration had it quashed in its effort to uh, normalize relations with Cuba in the mid nineties. Um, and we know that Cuba was placed on the list uh, in 1982 of uh, state sponsors of terrorism because it was revealed that Cuba was participating in the smuggling of drugs in Colombia and providing the hard currency of that trafficking of, of narcotics to the guerrillas to try to overthrow the government of Colombia. So they have a lengthy history and they were able to teach the Venezuelan leadership how to set up the Solis cartel. And they've also taught others like the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. So they, they are masters when it comes to the issue of drug trafficking and knowing how to cover it up too. Thank you. Um, you just mentioned the Clinton efforts at normalization. Uh, those weren't the first and they haven't been the last. Um, and one would assume they won't be uh, you know, the la most recent effort isn't going to be the last either. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what the consequences have typically been on the island when we've sought to normalize relations with the Castro regime? Well, I think we, we should talk about the consequences on the island, but also the consequences for the United States. Um, the first big effort to normalize relations and the most ambitious was with President Jimmy Carter uh, between 1977 and 1981. Um, he actually removed the travel restrictions, loosened the embargo. <clears throat> they opened de facto embassies, which were called interest sections, and started having negotiations with the Castro regime. Um, the consequences initially were not good for Cubans in the island. Uh, the regime felt it had a green light to repress. Um, they were able also to export uh, their opposition. They did release a number of political prisoners, but they released them into exile. And they also felt more aggressive regionally. So if you also look what happened in Nicaragua in 1979, the Cubans played a very important role in the overthrow of Anastasio Somoza and the installing of Daniel Ortega and the Sandinistas, um, along with uh, Soviet aid and weapons. And the nadir of that out of that uh, rapprochement was the Mariel boat lift in 1980, which we're observing now the uh, 40 year anniversary. Uh, Fidel Castro's bodyguard, his name escapes me at the moment, who wrote a tell all book in 2014, it was released in May of 2014 and died mysteriously in May of 2015, described how Fidel Castro personally oversaw the murderers, rapists, uh, psychopaths, that were mixed in with the good people, with a lot of good Cubans that just want to live in freedom. And he personally sat by the list and ensured a massive crime wave that killed a lot of Americans in South Florida in the early 1980s and also was one of the factors that led to Jimmy Carter not getting reelected in 1980. And that was just one instance. The second instance uh, with Bill Clinton in the mid 1990s, again, um, they started joint military exercises. They were doing outreach. The response of the regime again was to up repression. We saw massacres of uh, Cuban uh, rafters, Cuban swimmers, where they were using hand grenades and uh, snipers and people trying to swim over the Guantanamo Naval Base in 1993. In 94, we saw the tugboat sinking in which families were wiped out, uh, 37 men, women, and children killed. And then in 96, we saw the Brothers to the Rescue shootdown where 
uh, three American citizens and a U.S. resident were murdered over international airspace while trying to save the lives of Cuban rafters, um, blown to bits by Cuban minks, because the regime understood that it would not be a game changer for them. Um, the response of the Clinton administration in 96 being an election year was to sign the helms burden bill that tied in the embargo for a bit and pass control over to Congress. But within a couple years of his election, of re-election in 96, he was already negotiating another opening and in 2000 shook hands with Fidel Castro and opened up cash and carry trade, which turned the United States into one of the leading um, uh, countries doing business with the Castro regime uh, during the Bush years. And what about the most recent effort by the Obama administration to normalize our relations with Cuba? Well, it was disastrous. It sent the wrong messages. I think, um, first and foremost, they had secret negotiations between 2013 and December 2017, uh, despite the Cuban government being caught smuggling tons of weapons to North Korea, including ballistic missile technology, the Cuban government being identified as smuggling weapons into Colombia with the aid of a freighter from China uh, in 2015. Um, the administration and also having a Hellfire rocket uh, intercepted on its return from NATO exercises and mysteriously wind up in Havana in 2014 that they refused to return until it became public in January of 2016. Um, there were a number of things done by the Cuban government that should have been a no-brainer for the Obama administration to say, okay, this isn't working, and they kept pushing forward. December of 2014, when they announced their intention to normalize relations formally and openly, they released three members of the WASP spy network. One of them was doing a double life sentence for conspiracy to murder in the case of the Brothers to the Rescue shootdown. That individual, were, they, those individuals returned to Cuba. That individual now, Gerardo Hernandez, is heading up the organization that spies on neighbors across the island called the Committees in Defense of the Revolution. He's leading that up at the national level currently. Oh, he should be serving the rest of a double life sentence, one for espionage and the second for the murder of U.S. citizens and a U.S. resident. What has been the outcome of that? Repression exploded in the island. Violence exploded in the island. Prominent opposition leaders like Osvaldo Payas Sardinas, Lara Poyan, people who would have overseen a nonviolent transition in Cuba were extrajudicially executed. Um, Obama himself on his way out ended the program that provided asylum to doctors in third countries that had started during the Bush administration to address this trafficking of doctors. He ended that program as a, another concession to the Castro regime. He also closed the um, wet foot, dry foot policy, further tightening the Cuban Adjustment Act and closing the door on Cuban refugees, also in January of 2017. And the regime's response was a military parade in January 2017 presided over by Raul Castro, where the soldiers were chanting how they were going to make a lead hat uh, for Obama's head with the shots that they were going to be firing towards it. And the other thing that started in November of 2016 on Obama's watch was the mysterious brain injuries to U.S. diplomats that has left the U.S. Embassy shuttered. So that opening of Obama's administration in 2014, 20, January 2017, has actually led to an end result in which the U.S. Embassy now has less of a footprint in Cuba than it did as a U.S. interest section before this normalization effort began. Wow. Uh, thank you. Uh, so in some recent reports, I've seen uh, shortages of soap and detergent in, in Cuba. Uh, and with the pandemic going on, of course, you know, cleaning supplies are, are of crucial importance. And much of this reporting uh, parrots the regime's claims that this is the result of the embargo. Now, I thought that I understood that those sorts of items were exempt. Uh, but uh, I guess my, my question is, is that the case? Uh, and, and if they are exempt, you know, what's, what's actually leading to these shortages and, and what do the Cuban people see here? Well, um, 
indeed they are exempt. <clears throat> and the U.S. Uh, provides for soap and other uh, toiletries to they they can be exported to Cuba. Not to mention agricultural products. In fact, the chicken that Cubans have been eating uh, for years uh, comes from Tyson Chicken uh, in Arkansas. And uh, while Cuba is declaring the blockade placed by the U.S., you can actually see the packaging, some of it with red, white, and blue stars, with the seals showing Tyson being bought by people in, in, across the country. So it's laughable. Now, why the shortages of soap? Opposition activists have actually are circulating a petition against the internal blockade. The communist regime in Cuba has a number of restrictions in place along with its centralized planning that creates these shortages and also doesn't provide Cubans the opportunity to be able to use an entrepreneurial spirit to get around them. Uh, there are limits on the number of uh, soaps that Cubans, when there was travel between Cuba and the United States before this crisis, um, Cubans were limited in how much soap and detergent they could bring into the country. Inside of Cuba, it's a challenge to make soap because you, you should be able to make soap. You can use uh, cooking oil and a few other substances and make your own soap, except that the uh, cash regime doesn't want Cubans to have glycerin, which is an element that you can use for soap, but there are other alternatives you can use. But then what they'll accuse you of, if you're trying to make soap and, and sell it, or you know, they'll accuse you of hoarding, you can go to prison. So that makes the production of homemade soap problematic in the island. And that's sort of emblematic of what happens in many sectors of the Cuban economy. Thank you. Uh, now, we've mentioned the embargo a few times, and I know that you know, it's a somewhat controversial policy. Uh, it has you know, supporters and detractors, and many of the latter argue uh, that economic engagement might help liberalize the Cuban regime and that ultimately, you know, it would benefit the Cuban people, it would increase their prosperity, maybe solve some of these shortages. Uh, but the, the interesting example that we have in front of us of, you know, ongoing profound economic engagement, of course, is with China. And we've seen that rather than liberalize that regime, they have perfected their tyranny in a way that, uh, frankly, Stalin, Stalin could have only dreamed of and Mao probably did dream of. Um, you know, so it's, it's not clear that you know, normalized relations and economic engagement would be helpful, but at the same token, uh, you know, we've had the embargo, I guess, on and off or mostly on for a number of decades now, and we still haven't seen a change in the Cuban regime and the Cuban behavior. Uh, so, I, I mean, you, you've been thinking about these things for a long time, and so I'm very interested in, you know, what your recommendation is that we do here. Well, I think first and foremost, if we go back to the beginning of when the embargo was instituted, its purpose was not to change the Castro regime. Its purpose was to contain the Castro regime, and it worked. If you look through the 1960s, when Cuba was diplomatically economic and politically isolated, not just by the United States, but by many Latin American countries. Uh, Venezuela, Costa Rica, Colombia, and others joined together to kick uh, the Castro regime out of the OAS, and they also had their own economic sanctions against the Castro regime. And during that period, the Castro regime did not succeed in creating new beachheads of communism in Latin America. But over time, through their uh, sympathizers, the communist networks, and also a sincere um, believing people that believe in open markets and free trade as the way to empower people to liberate themselves. Um, the, um, resol the resolution to keep that policy in place weakened. It weakened first in Latin America, and we saw it in the United States during the Carter administration in the 70s. And the results have been, each time that we've seen a loosening, uh, the regime has been able to exploit it and expand its influence in the region. In Nicaragua with the Sandinistas in the 1970s, and they nearly also took over El Salvador and waged a bloody civil war there. Um, in the 1990s with Bill Clinton, you could see that Cuba was able to expand its prestige at a very difficult moment. As a matter of fact, I think if the United States had held fast on sanctions then and supported 
the Democrats, rather than uh, believing that the Castro regime could provide stability with, with terms of immigration, um, a change might have taken place then. Instead, they backed the continuation of the regime. The Castro regime ended up being able to expand its influence through its uh, uh, protege, Hugo Chavez, and turn Venezuela into a colony and create a much worse situation in the hemisphere. Um, and they've also assisted Daniel Ortega in his return to power. And that's also been another humanitarian uh, disaster in the region. So we can see on those three occasions, and, and now this third occasion with Obama, that the disaster of Venezuela was made worse. And we heard Secretary of State Kerry during their honeymoon with the Castro regime in 24, 2015, saying how they were reaching out to the Cubans to solve the problem in Venezuela, when the Cubans are the problem in Venezuela. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Uh, as as a final question, uh, you know, I I would ask this. So the Cuban regime has never been self sufficient, but instead it's always seemed to both need and to have a foreign patron. Uh, whether it was the Soviet Union or China earlier or Venezuela under, under Chavez and Maduro. Uh, now that Venezuela is much less capable of shouldering that burden, especially with the collapse in oil prices, uh, to what extent has China stepped up? And what are the costs associated uh, for the Cuban people of that, of that support? I, I know that in Venezuela, for instance, the Chinese now own some of you know, a large proportion of their infrastructure. Uh, you know, so what, what's the situation in Cuba? The situation in Cuba is that the infrastructure there has been deteriorating for the past six decades. Little girls have died because pieces of balconies have fallen on them. Um, the other thing that we have to take into consideration also is not just China, Mexico. And I think as the years go on, we'll start to learn more about what Mexico under Lopez Obrador is doing to back up Castro. I think also that we have to remember there's something called the uh, Sao Paulo, the Foro de Sao Paulo, the Sao Paulo Forum, where you have this network of communist regimes, terrorist organizations, guerrilla groups that coordinate their efforts. And China's there, Cuba's there, Russia's there, North Korea's there, Vietnam is there, Laos is there. Nicaragua is there, obviously Venezuela, but so is Mexico under AMLO. And um, Mexico has a lot of resources. And we know that with this crisis, they're definitely going in a much more, they're, they're taking advantage of the COVID crisis to move even farther to the left. And part of that's gonna be backing up the uh, lighthouse of communism in the world, which is uh, the Castro regime. Well, thank you very much, John. I think in mentioning the Foro de Sao Paulo, you may have just given us yet another subject uh, for a future webinar. Uh, you know, but I thank you for joining us uh, and for your ongoing work to confront communism both around the world and here in the Western Hemisphere. I thank everyone for attending. If you'd like to follow John's work, I remind you that you can find him at Notes from the Cuban Exile Quarter. That's his blog and on Twitter at John J. Suarez. Uh, please join us for our next event in the Understanding China series, which will take place on Thursday, April 23rd at 1 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time. The subject will be the CCP's War on Hong Kong, during which we will hear from author, photographer, political scientist, and visual sociologist, Dr. Daniel Garrett. You can find more information about the event and about the work of the VOC China Studies team at www.victimsofcommunism.org. Thank you all again. Have a great day and continued health.